I'll show you what we used to do, right? We would get one of these crate, one of these crate things. So if I die here, right? You could give everything to my dad and my brother, right? And give all my give all my records to Jasper. If I don't make this, I'm gonna be really pissed off, man. And then how am I gonna get down? Oh yeah, fuck it. Oh. So yeah, so we climb up like that. This was my spot here. And this was my mate Dan's spot over here. And rival rival graffiti writers would come and like paint over your stuff. Oh shit. And then, uh, sorry. <laughs> and then, so you'd have to come back the next week and then paint over their stuff again. That was just how it went. Man. I didn't think I was going to make that there, you know. I thought I was going to deck it. How did I get down? You know, made it. Sorry about that. <laughs> See, that's like, that's like all the that's all the grease that they put up to stop us from getting up there. Like nobody paints up there anymore, so it's not as much there. But that's that was for our benefit. For a lot of kids in Glasgow, it's a fucking tough place to grow up. I've seen kids from my school sleeping rough in the streets, pulling knives on people outside clubs and stuff like that. I was lucky. Although I've not had the best childhood, I was still lucky compared to a lot of these kids. Musically, we are lucky because we have amazing institutions like Rubber Dub and the Sub Club. And also like Soma Records, who, you know, launched the careers of people like Daft Punk and slam, of course. I was an angry child and I was getting into drugs quite heavily and I probably could be dead if it wasn't for all these things. Hello, it's me. This is where it all started for me. I went to DJ and yeah, started buying records and stuff um, and just building up my collection, I guess. Flyers from our old parties we put on LFO. Seismic was our first, the first event we did. Look, wait till you see the design on this flyer, man. That is proper, that is 2002, check that shit out. So that was, uh, so Spencer, he was actually the guy who start, he started the night. Jack Master, Chin Scratcher, probably the worst ever name for a DJ you could think of, and Milo, not the actual world famous Milo, just some guy called MYLO, no idea. That was the first one we ever did. We were 16 or 17 years old. My DJ partner in crime, Spencer, his dad owned the club, so he was managed to pull some strings, well, I say pull some strings, he just told the bar staff what was happening, and we put on a party called Seismic, which was an electro night, and it was based around like real electro, as you, as you say, not the bastardised EDM electro that you get now that Paris Hilton plays. But it's obviously the most boyish electro name you're going to give to your club night, but it seemed to be a good idea at the time, as these things do. During the day, they would store all the cutlery here, and then you could just we would just flip these open, and then you had the decks in here, and you can see how you can see how how what era we were doing parties here because a DJM 500 there. Which is an old and really shite mixer, and this is, this is the kind of shit we had to put up with. All our mates from school would all turn up. My older brother, who's two years older than me, who runs numbers and works uh, with us, they would all come down. If you went above a certain level, the sound system would just cut out. You know, it wouldn't dip, it just cut out, and you're standing there. You're 17 years old, right? And all your pals in the crowd, and you think you're rocking it, and then you just go in the red too much, and then the sound just cuts off. And of course, first time, everyone's like, whoa! Second time, maybe, 
and uh, after they third or fourth time, it's just like they just get annoyed. The first time we did our party here was when I really, really caught the bug for DJing because I'd never DJed, DJed out before. It did go really good. If there was ever any doubt in my mind of what for what I wanted to do, that was it. After that night, that was it. I was I was sold. That was me. I wanted to be a DJ. My life would be a lot easier if I if I moved to Berlin or I moved to London or something. But Glasgow's so real and and it keeps you kind of grounded the way people are here and like um, especially the sense of humour here. As soon as you come back, if you know if you think make come back from doing a, a gig to you know five thousand people in some lovely place in Europe or whatever and you come back and your friends just slag you off and bring you right back down to reality. You don't get away with any diva any diva shit here. We were a middle class family. We certainly weren't upper class. Um, my mum was by no means rich but she worked her arse off to make sure we had what we needed. That's my dad there. I think it was just before I started school that my parents got divorced, so I, I was probably four. My mum brought us up on her own. Single mum on a single salary, raising two kids. That's me when I was like six months old. It's me and my mum. When I was 14, I was in like third year at school. Uh, my mum passed away. She's my best friend in the world, to be honest. Um, and we used to tell each other that quite frequently. And it was, it was, she had been unwell for a while, but it, it wasn't like um, she, she wasn't terminal Ill or anything. It was still like a real, a real shock when she passed away. The coroner's report eventually came through as it being a heart attack. I remember coming into the close and like a couple of ambulance guys came down the stairs and they just gave me this kind of look, like a kind of pit, pitiful, sorry look. And um, at that point I, I kind of knew, I knew something was, was wrong, more more wrong than it had been before. And uh, I came up the stairs and I was told to sit in the living room. And um, I, I, I could see into the hall and uh, one of my mum's best friends had arrived, looking like really, really kind of, Devastated, and she came in, and me and my brother are sitting down, and she said, "You know, boys, you've, you've just got to be really strong. Uh, your mum's passed away, and for me, like when you're that age, like that that family structure, that's your your whole life, and to be told that that's just gone, this is kind of it's unbelievable. It, it, it didn't really set in for me. For and sometimes I still think that it's, it's still not set in. You know, like 10, 12 years after." My dad moved in uh, to look after us in this house, like almost immediately, you know, within a couple of days. So that was a real, it was kind of like a, a, real, a real culture shock for me and my brother. But I think because of that, me and my brother kind of became like tearaways a little bit. We didn't go to school very much. That was the time where I could I could have gone down the wrong the wrong kind of path in terms of drugs and um, not not knuckling down and. And uh, that's when Rubber Dub came into my life. How's it going? Any major musical movement in history has always had its hub in Glasgow. With a shadow of a doubt, that's Rubber Dub. That's where everyone goes on a Saturday to exchange stories about what happened the night before in the club or how their record's doing, how what gigs they've got that night. We got to do this thing called work experience, so for a week you don't have to go to school and you go to work for like a local business or whatever. Kind of knew I wanted to do music by then because when my mum died, my sister came to stay with us for a bit and she'd been in, she'd been, been an old rave and stuff. I remember thinking, I'm going to push myself and I'm going to go and try and get a job in a scary record shop where they've got all this weird music. They accepted me obviously because they wanted somebody to make them coffees and sweep the floor. Turned up my first day, two hours late. Hey, Chips. How's it going? The worst boy we ever had, he came from school and uh, it was a wee sort of work placement. You just needed a bit of work ethic put in here. They were like, what, 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 what kind of music are you into? And I was like, house. Like, like house do you, aye? I was like, yeah, and they're like, right, 
that's the house section, huge, big wall full of house records, about that deep, man. And you're like, right, you're going to stock check the whole house section. And not only are you going to stock check it, but you're going to then put it all in alphabetical order. So that was my punishment. That was my punishment for being late, but they would ask me to do that anyway. They would just try to tow my balls a wee bit. A Daft Punk promo came in and I was like, can I have this? And I was told, no, that goes in the bin, that goes in the bin, that one. And uh, then it was Wilbur that gave me, I actually asked about a record that I'd heard on the speakers, which was a uh, Model 500, The Chase, produced by a guy called Juan Atkins. I, and um, I remember the exact words as well, you were like, hey, get rid of all that shite, and this is, a, this is the first good record you'll buy. And this is the start of your, the start of your rubber dub education, I. Well, it was, just, it was just another wee guy at the time, you know? Uh, got lots of wee guys wanting jobs in here. And he's not a wee guy who thought he, you know, thought he was into his wee bits of music and thought he knew stuff about it. But the more you learn about something, the more you know you don't mu know much about it, you know? But uh, one thing about Jack is everybody's always on about, you know, how he's, he was late and, you know, about my lad and stuff like that. But, you know, he's quite a bright chap. When I was going off the rails, you guys took me in, you know what I mean? I could have gone the wrong way, as a lot of people I grew up with have, have gone, and probably a lot of people yourself as well, you know It's what good I mean? to have something to focus on, eh? Music's always been good for us. Rub -a Dub kind of was like my second family and my second home. We maybe had seen that there was a chance I was going down the wrong way, so they gave me a full-time job, um, and that was working for the distribution company. That was with Barry, who was like <clears throat> my mentor. He taught me everything about the industry. Um, and I was kind of his prodigy, his project. When he came to us, he was, uh, he was buying uh, filtered French house shit, as I would call it at the time, you know, or something more poppy dance music. I would never really be late when I worked with Barry, it was only with everyone else. Um, I think I looked up to Barry too much to take the piss with him. And uh, I would sometimes stay till like 10 at night working, stock checking records and le just learning him playing me stuff and just getting my musical education from him, really. You know, the jobs that I was given Jack to do, part of my, you know, the work needed to done, but part of it was, here's your musical education, you know, you've got a whole library of music here. They would introduce us to weird records that we wouldn't have been introduced to otherwise, so you'd sort of be sitting there, like, we'd be like, oh, check out this, like, I don't know, some French house thing, kind of, kind of like, pretty alright stuff, but nothing crazy, and then they'd be like, alright, check this out, and they'd just like put on like, you know, Model 500, or like, you know, Eddie Flash and Folks, or, you know, just kind of stuff that we'd never have heard, and we'd just be like... Oh. He would be starting to pick up bits of electro, you know, I would give him more experimental techno to listen to, you know, I liked a lot of house as well, but, but deeper Detroit house, so I would give him things like that. That was uh, Susie's massage parlor, before Rubber Dub had it as a shop, the first shop, and uh, I used to have sort of dodgy massages around the back. And happy the table happy for ha endings. And happy endings, aye. I used all, all the inheritance money that I, that I inherited off of my mat, spent it all on music equipment, bought my first set of decks um, with that money and all, my, all my, first, my first records and stuff. And even like people like Spencer, who's been, who's been like the, one of the, probably the most positive influence in my life. I met him as a result of my mum passing away because he was such a good guy, he's like probably one of the best people I've ever met in my life and he he made a conscious effort to approach me in the street because he knew what had happened to me and he was carrying a bag of records at the time. Jack actually was probably, you know, the strongest person I've ever seen in that sort of situation. He kind of just almost ended up, in terms of the music stuff, you know, everything else aside, he just ended up almost focusing on that. He definitely did, he just really kind of got absorbed in the act of, you know, playing records and learning about music and all the rest of it, through, especially through when he started his work experience at Rubberdub. I was maybe too young to recognise it as a kind of escapism of sorts. It was still, now looking back, it was really his main kind of, I don't know, I guess in some sense it was therapeutic to just kind of zone out and be able to just listen to music for hours on end. It became this sort of focus where you grab onto something to almost like keep you steady. And I think like for Jack and, and certainly for that, leading a lot of our mates, so it just turned into you know, this music thing. It was like, you know, that was now what we did. Martin and Wilbur, who are the two guys who ran it, and there was Barry as well. They just used to do this club called 6-9. So this is 69, and I, I will always call it the world, the world famous 69. They thought they were going to get people doing for dinner dances on a Saturday night, so that's why we were allowed a Thursday and not a Saturday. And then eventually they realised that nobody wanted to go for a dance after their curry. So that's then when 69 started on the Saturday nights. 69 was basically out 
in Paisley, 25 minutes cab or 20 minutes cab away from Glasgow. So we used to go, I mean, I think it was the first time I ever went to a club and that was to see DJ Assault. We would come here every Saturday night, me and Callum, and just have our, have our minds blown by music we'd never, never heard, heard before. It sounded like music from another, another planet, you know. Um, and we would see everyone here, like from, you know, Juan Atkins to, to Plaid, Black Dog, Mark Broom, who are the other early, early people that came? Lee Grange, the Holistic Records Holistic guys were yeah. a big crew. Matt Cogger, Neuropolitik. It was one of these places where people wanted to play rather than coming to play for money. Like, you know, you'd have six guys for Underground Resistance from Detroit coming to play and doing a live set for four hours just because they'd come and the vibe would be so good. They would just play and play on and play on and play on, wouldn't they? There was no bouncers or anything like that. We had a couple of girls doing it for us. and. It was just that self manage itself, you know, people would just come and they like it and if they liked it they'd stay and if they didn't they'd go. The, the, mu the music was the bouncer. It was, you know, right. because it's good at that right. time you were playing pretty crazy music that you wouldn't hear anywhere else. So, so if the, the local time. the local bams came in they would be like, ah, nah, rubbish. I'm away. We'd come on the Saturday and we'd be in Rubber Dub on the Sunday when Martin had his shift and we'd do a thing called Techno Karaoke where we'd, we'd sing him the tunes that we'd heard him playing the night before and he'd always instantly be like that. Ah. You'd, you'd give him two seconds and you'd go, oh, that's Underground Resistance, The Swarm, and he'd pick you out, you'd put it on and it was a tune that you'd been raving to on the Saturday night. To this day, the best, probably the best night I've ever had in my life was in there and it was a guy called, uh, Italian guy called Laurie D, um, who ended up being the first artist that we ever released on any of our record labels because we basically stalked him. We were basically super fans and we stalked him around the world for a couple of years after seeing him in here and couldn't speak any English and my Italian's not very good. <laughs> I don't want really like, ah. So he didn't have a clue what I was saying, but uh, in a nice way, um, it kind of all came full circle because he ended up being the first the first guy that we ever put any records out with. And um, that was the best night I've ever, I've ever had. Def certainly in there, maybe in my life, and I've still got it on mini list. Dad used to be like a, quite like a, to, a pure like a top mod in the West End, so I try and, I try and dress, dress as much like a mod when I go to see him. I was always really good friends with my dad, but he was kind of, he was more of my pal than my dad a little bit. And at the age I was when my mum passed away, is the age where you know you start go, hanging around with your friends a lot more than being worried about like being friends with your parents. Hello? Oh, it's me. You weren't answering the phone. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, I'm just on my way now. He was the first person to ever show, really show me music. I used to go up to his house at weekends and listen to old Motown records, Prince. We were um, more obscure stuff for a, for a, you know, an eight-year-old kid like Errol Clue and uh, just uh, great music, Average White Band, stuff like that, Steely Dan. He was just the guy when I was growing up that always, it was his words that kind of used to ring true with me about like, not listening to what other people think about you and kind of just being yourself and doing your own thing. Yeah, so he's, he's always been a kind of a big influence on my life, so it'd be good to see what words of wisdom he's got today. Hello? Hi, it's me. Can you come? Oh, thanks. What sort of music would you give me to listen to? If I said, if I got bored of a certain thing that I'd been listening to at home, what, well, and, and I asked you for something new, what would you give me? From the top, me? Otis Redding. Yeah, he was my favourite. Al Green. I've seen Al Green in concert and Otis Redding. Who else? Uh, Jackson Brown, David Lindley. There's a ticket up there. Steely Dan, I remember. My, your mother's favourite band was Steely Dan. I've seen Prince live. That was something at Parkhead Stadium in 1981 with my daughter Kate. It was absolutely perfect, of course. So can you, obviously when one passed away, I was 13 years old and you think you, know, you kind of know someone when you're that age, but obviously I prob you probably have, uh, had known her better than anyone in, anyone in our life and certainly better than myself and Sean did. So can you tell me a bit more about what she was like then? Especially like before before uh, Sean and I were born. 
I grew up with her. She was a fantastic dancer. Yeah. How'd you were not bad as well, though? Thank you. There was a dance called The Hitchhike, and it was like that, but she used to do it in miniature like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a culture shock when you, um, when you came to live with us, and I, I found it quite difficult. Did you? Not, not getting, not, not because of you. Just because it was, it was such a dramatic change, you know. Yes. From having mum there to all of a sudden. I know, I know. How would you rate me as a father? Um. Be careful. I know. I would be honest. Say, up until uh, my mum passed away, I would rate you ten out of ten. Mm-hmm. I think you're brilliant. I know. <clears throat> but that's probably because we didn't see you so much, we saw you once, twice a week. Yeah. After, I think we all find it, found it pretty difficult. Really? To be honest, maybe you don't, you don't remember. Why? Why did you find it difficult? For very valid reasons. You felt you felt sorry for me, you felt so bad for me and Sean. Mm-hmm. You probably, more than the heartache you felt yourself, you probably felt more heartache for, for Sean and I. Yes, I did. So, for that reason, um, you probably found it maybe a little bit difficult to to be disciplinary towards us, you know what I mean? I was a bit lax. You weren't always that way, but then, it, and because of that, it became like a, it came kind of like a friendship relationship, you know. Our pals would come up and hang out with you instead of us, because you became, you were kind of like one of the boys. I did my best, Jack. I know you did, and you did a good job. Thank you. Um, I'll maybe come round. I'll probably be back on Monday or Tuesday. Excellent. But going to make sure you pick up your phone. Of course. Thanks. Um, you're always welcome. And try and pay a plug on your mobile as well. So I'll give, but I'll give you a shout on Monday or Tuesday before I come, right? Good, thank you. Okay, hey, sound. See you later. Love and peace. Subclub, along with places like Panorama Bar and... DC10 is like one of the best clubs in the world. It's probably my favourite club in the world to play at. There you go, man. I want my dad, you're just sitting there with a hat. Hey, you know? Hey, you I'm Jack. I'm Jack. What's your, what's your name? Stuart. Stuart, nice to meet you, Stuart. <laughs> I hope they're in. I wish, mate, I wish. I my mo- my I modern mean. days are over, man. I you, I you. You're fucking at it, man. <laughs> you think I could be a model? How? No, I never fucking said <laughs> that. <laughs> How's it going? You alright? How you doing, man? How's it going? You can't really describe the vibe unless you get there. Everyone like bangs on the roof, hits the plastic bits inside the DJ roof, and it's just got one of the most unique, unique vibes in the world. But um, as much as anything in Glasgow, I don't think the sub club would be what it was without the people. The very, very special vibe in Glasgow. I think places like Rubber Dub and the Sub Club and and the arches provide an escape, escape for kids. It's how you meet people and it's how you make friends. Like It's how I've met all my best friends in the world. I've met through going out and I've met through music. Although Glasgow's a, it can be thought of as a depressing place and post-industrial and it's working class. In Glasgow, people were there to look out for me, whether I knew them or whether I didn't were there for me and this is the reason why I always say to people that I never want to leave this city. There's a vibe here man and I can't put my finger on it, if I could put my finger on it I'd bottle it and I'd be a millionaire but it's just like it's unique and it's it's home, it's home. <laughs>